gonna share some Q and A's on the Dalton Highway. Why we decided to add this to our journey, how we got ready for it, and kind of like how the road was, where you can camp along the way, all the things that you would wanna know if you're gonna travel the Dalton. So if you're coming to Alaska, tuck this one in your back pocket and keep it in mind for your next trip. And if you're not, and you just wanna know, stay tuned. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to No Ordinary Path. I'm Kristen. My husband's a travel nurse. We travel all across the country and right now we are exploring Alaska. This is one of those Alaskan adventures that is absolutely amazing, but also not talked about as much, I feel like. It's not like as extravagant as all the glaciers you're gonna see in Southern Alaska, but it is really cool to be able to say that you crossed into the Arctic Circle. <music> First up, why did we decide to travel the Dalton Highway? Honestly, it wasn't even on our list of things to do before we were thinking about coming to Alaska. What happened was we got into Alaska, we had just spent four days rushing through Canada and not really getting to enjoy the drive so much. I mean, it was really pretty and oh, if you haven't seen the episode um, crossing through Canada, day three through British Columbia was absolutely spectacular all that all the wildlife we saw and the scenery you should go check it out up here it was incredible so the Dalton a long time ago I don't know if I can say that before I was born my dad was a trucker and he took the Dalton Highway over Attigan Pass and I have heard stories of this growing up about how scary the road was and he, it was dark out and it was winter and icy and scary and and all the things and it actually has never really crossed my mind that that would be a road that I might get to experience someday we're right near the Dalton Highway while we're in Fairbanks was like, ding, I want to go see this. So we would get on the BLM website and the first thing that it says is, this is no ordinary road. And I was like, sold. We also really wanted to do it because not a lot of people do it. It's a little bit unordinary and a little bit out there and a little bit scary and it just seems like right up our alley. We wanted to be able to say that we took our kids to the Arctic Circle because how many people can, can say that? And uh, so then we started researching how we should go about this and it started from there yes we were a little concerned we definitely had some concerns we talked to both of our families about it and we kind of like talked through the things that we would need to do to make sure that we were prepared i want to put this out there this was something that was well thought out and we did do a lot of things to make sure that we had a safe trip if you're watching our dalton episodes the last two episodes just know that there is a lot of prep involved to make sure that you are safe because it is a very dangerous road and we happen to get really lucky with perfect weather. Before we left for Alaska period, we did a bunch of upgrades. You might remember we did a Trick My Trailer series where we upgraded a lot of the underbelly. She basically had a brand new like suspension system and axles, leaf springs, all that stuff before we even started heading towards Alaska. So we felt like we had done pretty well with our upgrades and it could handle it. We tried to time the weather as best we could. We looked at weather in Coldfoot, along Attican Pass, and in Dead Horde. It can be cloudy, it can be cold, and if there's any moisture, it is going to make for a very muddy travel day, which is terrible for your vehicle and you don't wanna travel in that. We spoke with rangers at the visitor center in Fairbanks. We asked them questions about the road and things that we could do to prepare better and where we could stay and where it was legal to camp. And we actually spoke with a person. They gave us a, another pamphlet that was a mileage log, much like mileposts, but it was specifically for the Dalton and it had a lot more information in it than just the milepost. We also watched a few YouTube videos so that we knew what we were getting into. We like, yeah, I like you're doing right now. We also made sure that we had groceries and food enough to last us for the whole trip so we wouldn't have to stop anywhere. There is one restaurant on the whole route. It is in Coldfoot and I highly recommend it. It was so fun to eat at the Trucker's Cafe. We had all of our own water, which we highly recommend because the water was a little iffy. Two places to get it along the road. You had to like pump it until the water was clear. And then even then it had a minerally taste. John actually taste tested it. It says it's safe to drink, but we didn't want to put it in our rig. We have spare tires for all of our vehicles, the truck, the Jeep, and the trailer only one it does recommend that you have two spare tires luckily we did not need it but we only had one and then we brought enough extra fuel for the jeep and the truck to get us back if we 
couldn't find any gas. We took both vehicles. We considered leaving one in Fairbanks, but the reason that we didn't do that is because we wanted to have an extra vehicle if we had to go get help. It is a very isolated road with very little anything along the way. So be prepared to have all the things that you need with you. Let's talk about the road itself. First of all, getting there on Elliott Highway is like a good little precursor because it is paved, but it has a lot of frost heaves the closer you get to the Dalton, Dalton Highway. In fact, I was like, are we on the Dalton yet? Because I don't know, this is really rough. You know, and then when you get on the Dalton, the first 20 miles are completely gravel and it's like up and down and windy. And then after mile 20, it kind of smooths out a little bit, turns to pavement for a little while. And you're like, whew, okay, we, we're, we're good, we're good. But it's like this weird little challenge when you first get on the road. For the most part, it is dirt and gravel and sometimes mud. There were a few places where it was wet enough to make mud there are there were graders all along the highway like we would come across graders that would take up most of the road or they would pile up dirt like in the middle of the road and so you'd have to kind of like go over this big mound of dirt to get to the other side and pass them we honestly preferred the dirt and gravel over the pavement the pavement was terrible it looks like an earthquake just went through and ripped the the street up it was steep there were several really steep grades on gravel road roller coaster hills was a section that was one of them was nine percent i don't know if there was a 12 percent on that one or not it does go up to 12 percent adigan pass was a 12 percent grade we went really slow most of the way we went 30 miles an hour there was some traffic there were other just single vehicles on the road there were like pickup trucks and then there were big oil rig trucks and then campers do we see any other people with campers yes we saw a couple of class c there was one that was a rental and i'm like do they know you're doing this so we saw probably two or three class c's and one airstream travel trailer that was at the five mile camp at the yukon river camp that we went to that was as far as we saw any RVs. We did not see any in Coldfoot. There were all they were all tent campers at Coldfoot. There's a reason it definitely beats up your trailer for sure. There was actually a little bit more to be had than I imagined. So there was a gas station at the Yukon River camp. And then at Coldfoot there's gas. There's also some at Dead Horse. It is very pricey. Although there's a ton of BLM land, there you can only camp in the designated camp sites or campgrounds. The road is used mostly for the pipeline and there's a lot of little turnoffs for the pipeline maintenance. You cannot camp or park in any of those pull-offs. The five mile camp at the Yukon River, it's five miles from the Yukon River, hence the name. There is fresh water there as well as a dump station. Then there is a campground at the Arctic Circle. We did not stay there. And then there is the one that we stayed at, which was Marion Creek, which is about eight miles north of Coldfoot. And there were tons of spots, big spots. The BLM land actually stops at Tulick Lake. We were bummed that we did not go all the way to the Arctic Ocean. At Dead Horse Camp or Prudhoe Bay, there are very limited places to stay. There's like one main camp type of hotel that you can stay in and there are no campgrounds. You can camp in some of the parking lots, like you need permission for that. If you want to get in the ocean or touch the ocean, you have to take a shuttle to the ocean and you have to book this shuttle at least 24 hours in advance and there is zero cell phone service all the way there once you're on the dalton highway you have no connection with the outside world so you need to plan it in advance and we kind of decided from the get-go that we weren't really sure what day we, we were going to be there we wanted to take our time and not be on any kind of schedule uh, so we did not make reservations. Also, our kids were very done in the car and unhappy kids make for an unhappy ride and we didn't want to push our luck. So we quit while we were ahead. And I hope you make it all the way there because truly, I really wish we could have put our feet in the Arctic Ocean. 
was more excited about learning all of this than my kids were, which I think made it that much more fun for me to research in advance and figure out how I could help teach our kids about what we were seeing and doing and why it was so special. I would highly recommend stopping in Fairbanks first. There is a little like interactive thing where you can go and you can see the pipeline up close. It talks about it. You'll get to see a pig which cleans the inside of the pipe. And you're gonna see more of that in this coming weekend, in this weekend's episode because we actually visited that after we returned. But I would start with that, go see that, go to the visitor center in Fairbanks, ask the rangers about it. They have all kinds of information. I got on YouTube, we have a premium YouTube account where we can download videos and watch them offline. So I downloaded things like the History Channel video on the Alaska Pipeline. I downloaded stuff about musk ox, about the Arctic Circle, and why does it stay sunny in the summer and stay dark in the winter? Mostly I ended up watching them because the kids weren't extremely interested, but we did watch a few things together that we could enjoy and learn some more about what we were seeing. When I said that I felt like Mrs. Frizzle, I was not lying. <laughs> there are lots of kiosks all the way up where you can stop and read about different things. The Arctic Interagency Visitor Center is phenomenal. If you make it to Coldfoot, do not miss it. It's one of the nicest visitor centers and it's in the Arctic Circle. I would highly recommend taking this adventure if you are going to visit Alaska and you have time to spare. Thanks again for joining us today. Make sure you check out this weekend's video. We're taking you back to Fairbanks and exploring all there is to do for a very small fraction, but some of the really cool things that you can do in Fairbanks. All right, we'll see you out there.